Hello again everyone and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Today we have with us Mr. Frank Holmes, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of U.S. Global Investors, a boutique investment advisor specializing in emerging markets and natural resources. Frank is also the chairman of Hive Blockchain Technologies, a cryptocurrency mining company with facilities in Iceland and Sweden. The company is listed on the TSX Venture Exchange under the ticker symbol Hive, H-I-V-E. He is also the co-author of the book, The Gold Watcher, Demystifying Gold Investing. We are delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Frank, and welcome to SBTV. Well, it's great to be with you in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, glad to have you uh, with us all the way over in, in Houston. Uh, Frank, if you could share with us a little bit about your background and also the book that you co-authored, The Gold Watcher, which I believe came out in 2008. I'm originally from Canada, and you'll tell by my accent. I've been living in Texas for over 25 years, so I'm known as a Tex-Can. Y'all come back, eh? <laughs> uh, and I originally started out as a basic quant analyst, very primitive compared to today. Uh, okay. screening stock yeah. or dividends. And then from there, I went into building a trading desk catered to U.S. in particular gold funds. And uh, and then with that, I went to corporate finance. And my first deal taking a company public was the biggest royalty company in the world today called Franco Nevada. So mm -hmm. my experiences yeah. have been many. And I moved here in 1990 to Texas from Canada, and I built up U.S. global investors. I like warm weather, and I like uh, a lot less taxes than in Canada. Okay. Frank, uh, can I ask you, what got you interested and started in the crypto space? Well, the crypto space was an interesting journey because the predominantly the inspiration came from my godson and my son. They were saying that you've got to understand millennials and how they trust things differently. And they don't trust uh, paper money and they don't trust paper money in particular because they saw what took place in 2008. Mm -hmm. And many of these millennials played computer games and those and digital games so they were rewarded in digital currencies so they became early adopters to the digital world in fact today in china they basically skip credit cards and everything is digital off your iphone or your samsung phone or any other phone you have right. uh, you pay everything right. electronically so there's a big shift i never trusted uber originally uh, i never trusted airbnb and i had to go and all of a sudden embrace this new digital world and, and that was the, my journey, but I was unable to launch an ETF in the space because America is very concerned, and same thing in Canada, with an ETF that would all would have, would show up with these Bitcoins that a hacker was paid and he sold them to the ETF. So they basically said due to anti-money laundering laws, AML, they wouldn't allow an ETF to have Bitcoin. And my friend contacted me and said, look, we've got this venture with young guys, would you be interested in it? And I did all this homework and I said, wow, I definitely would be interested because I'm not, I have no AML issue. I am mining a virgin coin. When you validate a crypto transaction, you get paid in those in that country like or that, that coin, uh, Bitcoin. So with that, it was with Genesis Mining, who's the largest cloud space mining company in the world. They are in 200 countries. They have 2 million users using their cloud base and their systems in Iceland and Sweden. So the fact that all of a sudden I would be the biggest miner, public company as a miner, that enthralled me, that excited me. And so I put up $5 million, became the chairman, and high blockchain technology became this raving success, and it went up a, a factor of 30-fold. Uh, it's corrected along with the cryptocurrencies, but we're mining, we're mining in Iceland, we've expanded in Sweden, uh, we'll increase our capacity within 12 months, by 20 fold uh, consumption of electricity. So everything is going along perfectly. But the really interesting part in this journey of me learning about blockchain and technology of cryptocurrencies was that a lot of the original gold investors bought Bitcoin early. I had no idea. A lot of these old guys, they basic, basically, they didn't sell their gold to buy Bitcoin, they diversified because they loved the fact that it was decentralized and it was capped at 21 million coins. And that's what excited them. And so 
in Germany is where the largest mining company came out of the world called Genesis Mining. It's a private company. And they also share within Germany, it was predominantly older, sophisticated investors that bought a little bit of Bitcoin at $10, $50, $100. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of theory out there that it was hurting gold. Absolutely not. I, I think that uh, I wrote about this. I've spoken about it uh, on other uh, social platforms. And uh, and uh, to me, it's, there's clearly manipulation was taking place because it came out in a court system of America. It came out in, in when it comes out in the court system that there was fixing of LIBOR, there was fixing of gold, there was spoofing, there was manipulation of the gold price. So naturally, there's this concern in the crypto world that since Bitcoin uh, all of a sudden became a futures market in December, that was the peak in Bitcoin. So now this this sort of uh, invisible arm out there is suppressing Bitcoin just like they've been doing to gold. So there's this theory, it's not been validated with Bitcoin and all the other cryptocurrencies, but it has been validated that there is a lot of manipulation by traders in the gold and silver market because our recent research showed that there's a high correlation to rising money supply along with that is rising gold prices. But for the past four years, it's basically seen money supply increase dramatically, debt increase dramatically, but not so with the price of gold. So gold is way behind on a relative basis. So the theory is, is that there's suppression taking place. Not the operative word is not manipulation, but there is suppression yeah. because if gold yeah. takes off, it makes gold, the dollar look weak. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. There's, there's obviously quite a lot of suppression going on. But last year had to have been a, a pretty big year, amazing year last year for uh, U.S. global in, investors in that you, you did invest in, in hype. Uh, what made you strategically feel comfortable or, or give the okay to go ahead and, and invest in hype? And what did you see at that time? Well, I saw that there was a big secular trend that millennials coming back earlier trusted. The other part of the research was I went to a conference in New York, the biggest in the world, called Consensus for the Blockchain Space. And the keynote speaker a year ago was Abigail Johnson, who's a CFA, as uh, a CEO, controlling shareholder of Fidelity, uh, in, which is a two and a half trillion dollar asset management company, the second largest discount brokerage firm in the world. Uh, and she has all of her employees having Bitcoin wallets, uh, or they have the access, they can have them, they can buy food with their Bitcoins. So she has embraced it as a new technology because Bitcoin is what email was to the internet. Bitcoin is unlocking the use of blockchain technology. And can you imagine there'd be no crash of 2008 if all trades were closed every 10 minutes. Bitcoin shows you can transfer value, whereas email showed you could transfer information for the internet now we can transfer economic value and ethereum comes along as the second biggest cryptocurrency and it's a smart contract so i became very excited about this new digital world hive blockchain it, it describes itself as uh, building a bridge from from blockchain to traditional capital markets uh, could you give an overview of the business model for hive and and how the company actually turns a profit well to start off with is that it's the first public company that allowed investors to participate. So there were many gold investors that were reluctant to go into the space and they were reluctant to open an account at Coinbase. Coinbase is a very fascinating growth cycle. In three years, they had more accounts, they grew more accounts than Schwab in 30 years. I mean, there's something happening in the capital markets. And today I found out well, last year that New York Stock Exchange has an investment in Coinbase and so does USAA Military Insurance Company. They had an investment and it's gone up 20 fold for them. So there's something big happening in this space. High blockchain was basically saying that most of this big industrial scale mining was private. It was Silicon Valley or it was Genesis Mining. There was no public vehicle. So that older investor that was reluctant to go and open an account at Coinbase, all of a sudden could buy a public company that was participating in mining virgin coins. And, and what happened with that is that we went out with a revenue model that we're gonna do a million dollars a month in revenue. Our stock exploded and we raised capital. And then we said, now we're gonna to go to a million dollars a week in revenue. And the stock kept climbing. We did another financing. And in the first three months of an operation, we raised $200 million. 
and we will consume megawatts of energy going from 2.5 megawatts of energy to 44 and a half megawatts of energy at very inexpensive energy in Iceland. It's green energy. It's not bad energy and it's surplus energy. So all of a sudden we're in the space, cheap electricity, and we're mining, starting off originally with Ethereum. And by September, we'll be, we're supposed to be mining Bitcoin. Uh, you mentioned Ethereum. Uh, uh, what other cryptocurrencies does, does Hive mine? And how does the company decide which cryptocurrencies to mine? Well, right now, when you go to mine um, Bitcoin, it's predominantly ASICs. You use an ASICs chip. Uh, and you got to think of the concept that a Bitcoin is like the long strand of spaghetti. And the fastest way to go through that long chain of spaghetti is to have an ASICs chip. But when it comes to Ethereum, which is a smart contract, it's more three-dimensional. It's like eating ravioli, which has spinach and ricotta cheese in it. So you have to have a, a GPU card, like they use for graphics computer cards, which they use for gaming theory, et cetera, all the games that are played on the, on the internet. Uh, so with that, the GPU card is the most valuable card, has a longer life to it. But what to me I want to share with your listeners is that what we notice in this space is that high blockchain and it came out with in its first quarter, we generated a 36% return on capital. Wow. Now the second quarter, the coins all fell, but our production increased 300%. So overall, we've been stockpiling Ethereum and we're mining some of the other coins, Ethereum Classic, uh, we're mining, uh, but predominantly the big full chain blown out will be in the last quarter of this year, when we'll be mining all the currencies, but we'll have Bitcoin ASICs chips and in one facility and the other facility will have a gpu cards which are in existence now and will just expand our production profile late uh actually earlier this year trying to find gpu uh graphics cards in singapore was pretty tough to do it was being bought up pretty quick it was and there's no doubt that come off now uh with the uh all the sort of media and sensational to me going against bitcoin ethereum and due to a fearfulness of regulations coming out. But there are still many other things happening, such as Goldman Sachs is getting into the space. You're seeing that Fidelity is building an exchange. So there's very prominent companies that are all of a sudden going into this space. And there's countries that are talking about coming up with their own cryptocurrency. So I just think we're early stage, like early years of the 90s of the internet. And so you, you mind the cryptocurrencies and, and I'd imagine it goes into some type of storage. It does. And the first thing we do is take our coins and put them into cold storage. And that's a great question because it really, it truly required by our CFO tremendous amount of steps and checks and balances to make sure that we can't get hacked, that the coins could get stolen. And we've been selling about 10% of our daily production and how we segregate and separate, which is going to go into what's a live wallet, which merely gets sold for, for paying bills. And the rest of the amount is basically goes into a cold storage uh, system. Okay. So, okay. yeah, that, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, what is your strategy regarding um, deciding uh, when, when a coin is to be mined and, and hoarded or sold? If you're hoarding the coins, you immediately want them in cold storage right. off the grid, off the electric grid. Uh, so there's no threat of being hacked. Uh, and I think that that's the most significant thing for your listeners to really appreciate. Uh, and, and the vault system is critical. In fact, in Switzerland, where they store gold, they now have for blockchain crypto storage facilities where they have them in a mountain. Now, I don't think you have to go to a mountain to have storage facilities, but the concept of taking them off the grid and protect them so no one can steal uh, the, 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 the cards that they're on and all of a sudden have this tremendous wealth. Yeah, I think that's that's a very important thing because um, there's a saying, if it can't be seen, it can't be hacked. And you don't want them on your iPhones now or your phones mm -hmm. because when you go into countries like even the U.S., there's been a huge increase of, of foreigners coming in and taking your cell phone and running data checks on it to see if you have more than $10,000 of cryptocurrency on it. Uh, because you're supposed to disclose if you're carrying more than $10,000 to comply with all travel, the same thing as in Europe. So I, I think that if, if you do have them, that you want to make sure everything is separated. You're not traveling with it. Okay, Frank, um, 
what would be your advice for uh, new investors looking to get into the, the crypto space? Um, what advice would you give them regarding uh, cryptocurrencies, going into crypto, uh, going into cryptocurrencies versus going into a stock uh, such as Hype? Well, one of the first things I tell people my vintage and older uh, is to start listening to your children and your grandchildren. Learn. I learned so much from the millennials and from my sons and, and their relatives of why they were trusting this new digital world. Uh, and a classic that really woke me up was it can take you a week to open a, a bank account. If it's a corporate account, it can take you three months. Yeah. It takes you five yeah. to ten minutes to open an account at Coinbase. In Canada, it's called Einstein, is, is the uh, place where you can open an account and trade. It takes only you know, 10 minutes, you've got an account that you can send money in and basically law, be long these, coin, these, these various ICOs. And the fast, the how quick, millennials have Tinder. Yes, no, yes, no. I had no idea about Tinder. And the fact that their 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 mindsets are so fast and quick, and they I would never trust some person on a on a digital platform like this to have a date with. Uh, but no, millennials do. So people my age have to learn to live through millennials of how they're trusting this new system, and that way it's easier for them to embrace buying a coin or owning Bitcoin, etc. Yeah, we had um as you know we're a, a precious metals company, and and we had quite a few millennials. Uh, last year uh, earlier this year i should say as uh, the cryptos were going down they were pretty savvy where they uh, shifted their cryptocurrencies over into gold and silver and found some safe harbor and and waited it out brilliant absolutely brilliant uh and you know i love about gold and i write about this so often is that since the beginning of this century bullion has outperformed the s p 500 two to one 200% out of performance. And last year, everyone complains about gold and it was up 13%, still double digit. So gold has been a phenomenal asset class. I continue to advocate a 10% rate weighting in, in bullion and rebalance every year. In addition, I suggest that they look at gold stocks and we're seeing money actually going into gold stocks because they have high free cash flow today. Yeah, is gold one of your strategies for hedging when cryptocurrencies are on their way down? I've never looked at it that way, but I've, okay. I'm a big believer in diversifying, and, and then you can do this mean reversion. Could you tell us about some of your plans that are in the pipeline for the uh, upcoming next 12 months? Well, as, as you as global investors, we're really proud that we just launched a year ago our smart beta as sort of a quant approach to picking gold stocks. Uh, and it's phenomenal what it's been able to do in the first year. It's outperformed the GDX and GDXJ by a wide margin. Uh, those gold equities were down last year. This year they're positive. Uh, and so I think this idea of screening out bad gold stocks is very, very important. If you're a, a gold stock and a bullion investor, uh, it's important that you just don't buy any gold stock because they're not pure like gold. They're not pure like silver. You can go buy a pure ounce of gold, a pure ounce of silver. Uh, buying a gold stock, you have to be very selective. That You want that 999. You want it pure. So we focused on creating Go Gold. It's called, uh, the ticker is GoAU. It's listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And rather than trying to guess what gold stock to buy, it buys 28 of them. Three of them are what's called royalty companies. Uh, which is basically 30%, and they rebalance every quarter. Every quarter, we kick out the gold stocks, which are not showing great value on a per share basis, and we call high grading the gold stocks. So that's been very exciting for us going out to tell that story. And when it comes to high blockchain, I think the big story will come in the fall when we're fully using capacity of 44 and a half megawatts of energy, and we're mining Bitcoin along with the other currencies. Uh, and I think we're still the most dominant player in this space. Uh, when you take a look at liquidity, uh, we've come off. And I think the bigger part for your investors is really important. And I write about this on my website. And the title is called Managing Expectations. Now, Warren Buffett said, if you want to have a long-lasting marriage, have low expectations. Therefore, everything's on the upside. And with that, it comes to capital markets. Bullion's daily volatility is plus or minus 1%. That means approximately 70% of the time, it's a non-event for gold to go plus or minus 1% in US dollars. Gold stocks are 2%. Mm -hmm. 
Ethereum and Bitcoin are six and seven percent. The daily volatility of the currencies are much greater, these cryptocurrencies. So you really want to be a buyer when they're down six or seven percent. If you're going to start nibbling and accumulating, just like I advocate for bullion, buy gold when it's down one percent a day. If you're going to put 10 percent in, wait for those 10 days that it falls one percent and you accumulate a position in down days because it, when it turns, it has these spectacular moves. Uh, and that's the best way to play the volatility. So volatility shouldn't fight you. It should be your friend. Okay, that's some good advice. Uh, last year, there was quite a bit of volatility, but on, on the upside uh, for Bitcoin uh, last year, 2017. This year, it, it's a bit subdued um, relative to last year. Uh, but where do you see uh, cryptocurrencies right now with this so-called correction and seemingly like the, the interest or the, the volume seemingly slowing down a bit? Well, I, I think a big part is just the negative media. You can just see it. It was all positive around the world in the yes, last quarter of 2017. And then it went one, 180 and it went negative, 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 negative. Almost like it was orchestrated uh, on, on the platform called Medium. Uh, there's a great article that talks about the, the fifth uh, state, uh, the fourth state, and how it was orchestrated. But be as it may, I don't like to get pulled into that drama, except for that it's important to recognize the threat of government regulations and, and how the regulations will take place. Uh, I think that the UK government and the and the basically the head of the monetary authority in the UK is the most advanced in writing white papers explaining how there's be part of your portfolio. Uh, I think that we've seen a sell-off this year. When, the, when, when we first were going to meet with the Senate Department, the SEC, and then a rally, then there was a meeting with Congress, it sold off, and then the tax season, it sold off again, then we have a rally. I think mid-July, it's only a couple of weeks away, the G20 finance minister is supposed to come out with a global sort of direction, rules and regulations for the crypto world. And, and I'm a big believer we do need some regulations because the ICO market, initial coin offering, it just became too dangerous because there were too many coins being floated that did not give you full, true, plain, and timely disclosure. Uh, there were cheap forms of risk and capital. What we did see is that the junior mining space and technology space lost this speculative capital. Uh, it wasn't going, it was all going into ICOs. Five billion dollars went into this space. And, and there were scams there. And so I think the regulatory world is going to come to clean that up and that will make the industry much more robust and better. So in the second half of the year, after the G20 come up with their numbers and their rules and regulations, I think we'll get a, a rally going on. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the, the sell-offs going on. Uh, despite the sell-offs, there is still huge adoption, mass adoption going on with, with cryptocurrencies. Uh, in your opinion, best guess, when do you think we will see cryptocurrencies being used as an everyday transaction in, in the masses? Well, it's growing exponential. So that's really challenging for me to come out to give you a linear line. But I think what you can do is look at biological models uh, and you can see like Metcalf's law explains how things, more adopters become involved uh, than all of a sudden, particular Bitcoin, the more the price can rise. Uh, and I think that you have to take a look at uh, the adoption of the internet cycle who won? Remember, we used to have Ask Jeeves in the 90s. Well, that's history. Yahoo is basically being surpassed by Google by a wide margin. We don't know who's going to be the winner. But we do know that the blockchain is going to revolutionize banking. It's going to change settlements. It's going to make that there's no more fraud, illegal shorting that's taking place in the stock market because things will have to settle. And we're going to go to T plus zero settlement. Uh, and things will settle on time by the use of blockchain. Also for corrupt, for coffee, for, for contraband, and things of that nature, they're gonna all go on this blockchain system. So I think that we're gonna see a revolution, we're gonna see early things, the things I'm learning about like Satori, uh, which is for the gaming industry, how they're using blockchain and they're processing millions, 500 million uh, uh, transactions a second, people messaging back and forth. And that technology is being used in New Zealand, which is closer to you than San Antonio, Texas, to manage all the traffic and all the uh, all the facilities in the municipality of Auckland. Uh, so they're basically embracing a form of blockchain technology to manage traffic. Yeah, and we've also talked quite a bit about millennials and how they're embracing uh, the new 
new money. Let's just call it new money because that that's what it is. Uh, the cryptocurrencies. How do we we get our our older people, uh, the older generations, to understand that they're they don't necessarily have to see it as one or the other, where the two can actually work with each other, cryptocurrency and gold. Don't judge your grandchildren. Learn from them. Be like Christopher Columbus. Be an explorer. Explore to discover. Take the risk to explore and discover. Have a youthful mind by listening to them, why they're playing this game, how it works, what's going on with it. And then all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off. The lights are on, and it's showtime for your brain to feel youthful again. Can we call cryptocurrencies at this point a store of value? I Clearly, Bitcoin is more of a store of value. The other ones are being more quickly used for facilitating of a transaction. Um, Bitcoin shows you can use the blockchain for tra transfer. It's more about the transfer of wealth, the yes. transfer of economic yes. transactions. I think that that's the best way to look at the blockchain technology and all the bank transactions. The fact that, that we have in, in Texas, there was an earthquake in Mexico and the cost of sending money down to Mexico is so expensive with Western Union. There's just no reason for it when they could do it from their iPhone and send money electronically you, through a blockchain mechanism. I think that money transfers will go through a revolution. I think all the bank uh, back office transactions and the stock brokerage, why the New York Stock Exchange invests in Coinbase, because they see that we're going to go to electronic trading 24-7 around the world. I think that's a big thing for the stock exchanges and the regulatory bodies to recognize that we have to go to a 24-7 trading rather than from 9.30 to 4 mechanism, because that's how millennials function. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, what advice could you give our listeners as far as, uh, let's say they, they start getting into cryptocurrency and they want to store it? Uh, there's all types of things, hot wallet on their phone. We have trezors and things like that. We have cold storage. What, what advice would, would you give people just starting to come into crypto, especially the older crowd? Cold storage, for cold sure. Storage, for sure. Cold storage. Take it off, and, and and don't speculate that you're going to make a ton of money. Just diversify, and buy in the down days. You know, and uh, a lot of the early gold adopters that also were early Bitcoin adopters only were told put one percent of their liquid assets into Bitcoin, and it's been a phenomenal win for them. What's your opinion on tokenizing gold on the blockchain? Well, that's a big issue for the securities commissions because they look at that as being a security. It's not a currency. Mm. And there's a real asset test for what is a currency versus what is a security. Uh, I think it's brilliant. And I think that when the, the, the Royal Mint of the U England uh, basically gets one, they were supposed to do something with the CME, uh, when that finally gets in the marketplace, I think that it'll be like the GLD was. It'll absorb $50 billion worth of gold. The fact that if you had a, a one gram of gold behind each uh, this new uh, digital currency uh, that it, tra it traded 24-7 around the world, that a lot of people would buy gold through this mechanism and millennials would buy. Uh, there's a new gold jewelry company that started like an Amazon called Manet. And you can buy 24 karat gold jewelry in the U.S. It delivers and it basically, they won't sell it to you at more than a premium of 10% of the price of gold that day. They'll always buy it back from you. And why is that important at a 10% discount? Because that's what happens in India. And, and India is the largest consumer of gold. In fact, the millennial women, I mean, not millennial, but Indian women, Indian women have six times the amount of gold that Fort Knox has. And they trust gold. And I write about this as called the love trade. And what's so important is that 60% of demand for gold is love. And in Singapore, you can see in the, in the stores where you can buy 24 karat gold jewelry. You don't see that in the U.S. You see it all through the Asia, and you see it in India, and you see it in the Middle East. So I think you're seeing that adoption here, at like Benet, and I think you're going to see all of a sudden millennials could buy a gram of gold in a crypto format. I think it consumes $50 billion of gold. Yeah, I, the love trade, it's, it is a big thing here in Singapore. You, there, there's a place called Little India. It's really, um, they will be buying gold and they will be passing it on to, to their 
their wives, uh, their girlfriends, their family. It is a real thing. And, and you look at Modi, what he did 18 months ago mm. is took back currency and, and transfer it out. It hurt gold short term, but the gold can't wait back. The ruble went down. Uh, it, and it doesn't matter. Gold will always be trusted over governments in, in India. Uh, and I think the cultural affinity uh, goes the same thing with China, that they'll always give gold, 24 karat gold jewelry, simple gift jewelry. Right. Frank, you, you've laid out some pretty interesting things here. Uh, could you share with our listeners how they can find more of your work and your writings? Well, we write every week. Uh, and we write about what's an impacting different asset classes. It's called the Investor Alert, usfunds.com, U-S-F-U-N-D-S.com, and subscribe to the Investor Alert or Frank Talk blog, my blog on my global travels, uh, from Switzerland to Singapore to India to China, all over the world. Uh, in the last quarter of this year, I'll be down in Lima speaking to the biggest mining conference, uh, and I travel all over and, and comment on my 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 travel experience of meeting people, culture, and financial markets. Last question: uh, Could you share with us what U.S. Global Investors does to to give our, our listeners more of an of insight as to what you do there? Uh, you know, U.S. Global Investors, we have a quantum mental where we use quant models along with fundamentals to look at stocks. That's what's really important and the, and the basic genesis behind our ETFs is a very disciplined quant approach and our tacit knowledge of traveling around the world. So we write about this in Investor Alert every week. We have three strengths, three weaknesses of what happened last week to an asset class. We talk about bullion every week. And then we talk about next week, what economic data points coming out, which could be a strength or a weakness for gold or the stock market or cryptocurrencies. We also believe that government precursors are, are a change, and one has to look at monetary and fiscal policies. So we've created an algorithm that we look at the G7 countries, and we compare them to the E7 countries, the seven most populated countries in the world. And we look at monetary and fiscal policy, and what we found was that monetary policy bifurcates again. It's either money supply or it's real interest rates. And fiscal policies are tax and spending. So we compare the E7 countries to the G7 countries, and we can see like big, slow-moving tectonic shifts taking place in the global landscape. And we write about those, and it helps our investment discipline. We're a public company on NASDAQ, uh, the ticker is GROW. Uh, as a public company, we're an investment advisor. Uh, we have mutual funds. Uh, we're also the third largest investor in high blockchain technology, uh, and which is listed over the counter in the US and listed in Canada as HIVE.V. Uh, and so we are unique in how we look at the capital markets. And we launched two ETFs. Go Gold, which we talked about earlier, Go AU is the ticker. And we launched Jets ETF, which is the first uh, global airlines ETF. Interesting. We, you're a, a really fast moving guy. We really got to stay on our horse to keep up with you over there in San Antonio. Um, but Frank, um, Frank, we do thank you for coming on the show. And, and we do hope we can do this again with you sometime. Uh, again, your insights, absolutely incredible. And we will certainly be directing our viewers to, to your website and see your work. Well, thank you very for your very kind thoughts. Thank you also, Frank. Really do appreciate it. And Shay Shay. Shay Shay. <laughs> thank you. You you know you know more than, than you know more Mandarin than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's twice and as you know much what? now. And uh, my other favorite word is so uh, what she won means i like this i like it i like this interview that was frank holmes chairman of hive blockchain technologies and ceo of usa global investors for more of his writings on hive blockchain and precious metals please visit his website www.usfunds.com if you like this video please hit the like button and subscribe to the sbtv channel to be updated on new content 